so I'll share my screen uh, you'll be seeing my terminal here and most of what we'll be doing has to do with the terminal uh, after today's session I will be uh, giving you uh, video tutorials and some material which you can learn uh, partitioning from uh, that's something that you can't learn in one day so if you have doubts you should ask the DevOps team channel is here so I'll I guess I can uh, if, if you look at your uh, DevOps whole uh, server what you'll see is there is DevOps discussion which is a public channel there's DevOps PR so any PRs that you make you want to copy and paste the link here and notify me or Akash. Akash is your team lead. Uh, so whatever task that is going to be assigned to you by Akash, once you've completed, just let him know because we have a lot of work to be done. It's really hard to, you know, uh, keep track of everything, even though we get emails. Uh, it would be really appreciated if you could uh, ping us here on the DevOps PRs uh, channel and let us know that you have completed a task and you have uh, filed a PR and DevOps team is uh, basically the general discussion for where we'll be discussing ideas, stuff that we can add to the operating system and st apart from TCT Linux, the DevOps team also, uh, what we do is we deploy the websites that the web team is making. All right. So the fundamentals that we are going to be covering today is going to be uh, applicable, not just to TCT Linux, but also uh, deployment because uh, soon we will be moving to cloud and whatever terminal stuff that we are learning today uh, it's going to be applicable in the cloud all right so this is the bare minimum basics that you have to learn again like I said I'll be providing resources which you should go ahead today tomorrow uh, learn on, on your own pace uh, and on Sunday uh, Sunday is actually uh, not working for us but we'll have a small 30 minutes uh, doubt solving slash uh, a mini evaluation session so that I'm uh, confident that you'll, you guys will be able to work on the projects uh, from Monday onwards, all right? So up till now, do you have any doubts? Anayne, uh, uh, doubts here. Okay, so yeah. uh, we'll be primarily working with Arch Linux. Uh, I am on Arch Linux itself. Uh, we'll be going through some basic stuff, like I said, uh, before you even like jump into the command line. So most of you know what NeoFetch is, right? Uh, yes. How to read stuff here. Uh, so our shell is bash. I'll, I'll show you how to find this and how to find a lot of stuff that is displayed here uh, without running the NeoFetch command. So uh, in your interviews, I asked, for example, how do I find out the kernel? So you said, most of you said you can run the NeoFetch command and then you can find out the kernel, but uh, there are other ways to find this thing out. All right. So just to give you a, a little example, if I want to find out the kernel, the, the command is uname and I can find the kernel by the same thing by typing uname dash R and there's a lot more uh, with respect to the kernel. So uh, if I run, uh, we will talk about man pages uh, once we get into CLI, but if I write man uname, uh, what you get is basically the manual page of uh, what the uname command can do. So if you go through this, R stands for release uh, and basically prints the kernel release. If I want to print all the information regarding the kernel, I'll be typing A, right? So uname dash A, uh, it's going to give me all the information about the kernel that I'm running. So this is one, uh, one example of what I'll be teaching you how to get information that NeoFetch uh, displays, uh, but using actual commands because you can't be running NeoFetch on every instance on, on, on let's say a cloud based machine, right? So when you want to find out, let's say the CPU information, what CPU is installed or, or, or what, uh, kernel you have, what uh, shell that you are running, then there are certain things that you can do on, on a development environment where there's no CLI, uh, when, where there's no, uh, graphical interface, basically it's all CLI. Uh, so you can find out these information, right? So let's, uh, I'll quickly share a Jamboard here. Uh, we'll have to get started with operating systems basics. Uh, so since you're in second year, you uh, might not have the subject. For a lot of people, it's in third year. At least in my department, it was uh, in third year. 
So I just quickly uh, open a new Jamboard and we'll discuss basic operating system structure here. So here it is. Let me know if it is visible to you guys, okay? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So uh, before we even begin, I'll just say that uh, I'm using my mouse to draw, so it's going to be pretty bad. But so so you want to uh, ask doubts, uh, clarify, uh, if you if you don't understand anything, okay, it's, it's completely fine. You can stop me and ask doubts. Okay. So uh, a basic Linux based operating system. Now, what Linux is? If I might ask you, can anyone tell me what exactly Linux is? Vinay Sarthak, Himanshu, can you tell me what Linux is? Linux is an operating system which is open source. Yes, it is an operating system. Okay. Uh, so, this is a thing which a lot of people with. Let me just title this. So you said Linux is an operating system. Actually, Linux is just a kernel. It, what is a kernel? Kernel is basically a piece of software that basically acts as a sandwich. So imagine there is a sandwich, okay? So you have a bread over here and you have a, another bread over here, all right? These are your breads. Uh, and there is something in between, some patty or some, some vegetable or something that, that is here. Let me just draw that. Let's say there's some tomato over here. All right, this is your burger. So if I talk about this in the sense of operating system, this is your software. What software am I talking about? This is your application software, okay? So your browser, for example, that that's kind of the application software that we are talking about. And this is your hardware. Your hardware is what? Your keyboard, mouse. More, more specifically, your hardware is your CPU your motherboard, your RAM, your hard disk, your SSD. All right. So this is your hardware. This is your software. This is basically where your kernel is. This, this tomato or whatever this vegetable is, this is your kernel. Okay. So kernel is also, so Linux is basically a kernel. It's an operating system kernel and Linux is not an operating system completely entirely in itself. Okay. So what it does is basically it sandwiches your hardware and software and it enables interaction between your software and hardware. So a lot of your software will require your hardware because all software that is running, they have processes. So these processes, they run on your CPU, which is your hardware and kernel is that program, which allows you to do this. All right. So when you learn operating systems, uh, in, in more theoretical way, you will learn something about a thing called CPU scheduler. So you run a lot of software on your computer, right? I currently have a bunch of software. You, you guys might have heard about this program called htop. So there's a bunch of processes yes. that are running here. System D is one process system. We'll talk about init systems later on. System D is like one of the more uh, uh, important processes that we have on, on, on our systems. And it's one of the more, uh, it, it's one of the more initial processes that uh, spawn when you turn on your computer. So you can look, I have, I'm recording this session. So OBS is running, discord is running. X is basically my window uh, uh, server. So every uh, every operating system has a display server. Without it, you can't run your uh, uh, graphical environment basically. So X is my display. All, all the applications that I'm using, I'm using my network, I'm using my Bluetooth device, I'm using, uh, I'm on GNOME by the way, so my uh, display manager is there. All of the software that I'm using, these are processes that are running on my computer. Okay. And all of these processes, they will fight each other to take that CPU computational power. Okay. So there's a thing called CPU scheduler, which basically uh, provides a queue to, to which process can start working, uh, which, which, which process can take the CPU and use the compile time. So the CPU scheduler is also part of the kernel. Okay. So, just to sum the kernel up, Linux is a kernel. Okay. You can, if you want to uh, see the source code of the Linux kernel, it's on Linux Torvalds uh, GitHub. So if I go to github.com slash Torvalds, it's here. If you go to Linux, this is the source code of the Linux kernel. And basically what the kernel does acts as a sandwich between your software 
एंड योर हार्डवेयर अभी तक कोई डाउट है यू कैन फील फ्री टू आस्क सो नाउ यू माइट आस्क दैट ओके सो लिनक्स इज अ कर्नल सो वॉट एग्जैक्टली इज एन ऑपरेटिंग सिस्टम देन सो विल जस्ट ड्रॉ लाइन हियर ओके योर ऑपरेटिंग सिस्टम इज बेसिकली योर कर्नल वॉट एग्जैक्टली इज एन ऑपरेटिंग सिस्टम राइट लेट मी जस्ट गेट दिस what is an operating system then so your operating system is basically your kernel which in our case is linux okay and then we have an init system we'll talk about what this is in our case this is system d i just showed you in htop and then you have some kind of display server uh in our case this is x okay uh and then you have some kind of uh display manager slash graphical environment so in my case particular case this is gnome plus gdm uh this is uh my give me a minute this is my gui all right uh there are bunch of things that also work here so you have your shell for example which in my case in most of our cases is bash okay so this exactly is an operating system so when we say when anyone asks you in the future what linux is linux is an operating system kernel on itself linux can't do anything it requires all of these other software uh, that basically are building blocks for an operating system okay so linux is a piece of system software uh, all of these bunch of software are also system software they rely on the kernel uh, and they mostly are software that will utilize hardware how do they do that through the kernel okay we remember this diagram so this is the basics of how operating systems work this is the basics of how a linux based operating system works and what linux is in its entirety all right so with that being said uh let's start with uh basic commands before we even start with basic commands let's start with uh, file systems why is this important is because you when when we start with uh, commands we both may, uh, we are mainly talking about commands that will allow us to uh, manipulate the file system so let's talk about the file system a little bit over here you are going to be seeing uh, in this folder so if you go to your uh, your terminal and you type in ls root this is where your file system is so you have bin boot dev etc home lib lib64 all of this stuff is visible here as well okay so uh we have a bunch of uh, partitions on uh, our disk the ideal way to do this is you you uh, let me just install this command real quick So the ideal way to partition your disk is you basically have a root partition, you have an EFI boot partition, and you have home. Home is where your personal data is. Boot EFI is basically where your bootloader resides, and uh, root is basically where the root user resides. But apart from that, all the system files reside. So uh, the reason why the root user and uh, resides in the system files directory is because these files, if they are being modified by someone who doesn't know what they are doing. you can basically end up in a system that won't boot in a system which basically is usable uh, unusable uh, so we basically create two users we'll get into users I, i know this might get confusing at some times but when we uh, get into users this will make more sense so we have two users on the system uh, the first user is the root user and the second user is dk uh, you can always see uh, basically you can echo uh, i guess users is the the right, the right one yeah so you can echo the user and it is dk and if i sudo su uh, i'll in the root user and if i echo uh, user so uh, it's root right now so i'll just exit root and i'm back uh, in my own system right now so there are two users in this system one is dk which is me this dk user has permissions to the home directory uh and the home directory is also 
mounted on a home partition. Uh, you can see the size, how much used, how much is available uh, over here, which uh, SSD uh, and which partition it's mounted on, what's the file system. We'll get all of, uh, we'll get to details of all of this later on. Uh, and then there's the root user, which resides uh, and has permissions on the root uh, mount. And the root mount is on this particular partition. Again, the file system and the size and everything is available here. Okay. So this guy, this root user, he has access to this folder. Okay. And over here resides all the system files. So we have bin and you will also see something called S bin. So bin basically stands for binary. Binary is anything that is executable on a Linux system. So on windows, you might have seen dot exe. Anything that is executable on windows is dot exe. On Linux, it's going to be a binary. All right. So if I want to execute any script, whether it's a Python script or a shell script, or it's maybe a C++ or C program, uh, we all have to compile it or interpret it into a binary. That binary can be packaged to be stored in this bin or sbin directories. And then if, if I just go and uh, show you the contents here, for example, you run your ls command, right? So see the, the ls commands binary is here. So when I go to my terminal and I invoke the ls command, I can basically, I'm basically invoking this ls command. And all of these commands, if you uh, look at it, this ls cpu, for example, I can run this command ls cpu. All right. And this will give me information about my cpu. So there are a bunch of, even CD command is here, for example. So if you see CD command, uh, you'll, you'll find it somewhere here. There's also uh, PWD somewhere here. See, there is PWD here. So all the commands that you basically run on your terminal, they are in bin or has been, all right. Uh, let me just clear this. Uh, the difference between bin and has been is basically, uh, you, you have any doubts? Yeah, so the, the difference between bin and sbin is basically uh, any program that requires pseudo privileges goes into sbin and any program that doesn't require pseudo privileges, uh, for example, ls, cd, pwd, all of that goes into bin. All right. Then we have the boot uh, directory. Boot directory basically has uh, your bootloader, pretty intuitive. There's, uh, I can just show you the contents here. So there is your microcode, there is your kernel image, which grub and grub is the bootloader in our case, it will be using these images to boot your system. Then there's uh, a device directory, which basically has some uh, device IDs. So our SSDs, for example, NVMe, NVRAM and all of this are uh, everything on Unix is basically a file. So all your devices are also going to be stored as files. Okay. That's how you can invoke them through the terminal. So the devices directory has your devices that are stored as files. ETC, a lot of people call it etc. A lot of people call it edit to config. These have this has all your configuration files for all your programs. So all the programs that are running in bin and sbin, their configuration files are here. So for example, Pacman. Pacman is our uh, package manager. Pacman, uh, I guess it does it have a it has a man page, right? So it's a package manager. It resides in sbin because it requires root per, uh, privileges. If I run Pacman, it is here. You can search for Pacman uh, in Sbin. Uh, Pacman's configuration file will reside in etc. So if I search for pacman.conf, uh, there is the pacman.conf, and I can just spawn this out uh, to, to show you. So just give me a minute. This is the pacman.conf, all right? So configuration files of any program that reside in bin and Sbin are going to be in etc. Home. Like I showed you in the terminal, if I run DUF again, this guy, uh, this user DK, uh, his, uh, whatever he wants to do without, uh, without obviously it's pretty annoying to keep, uh, doing basic daily tasks with, uh, sudo. Uh, so they get a home directory to do, store your files and music and whatever you want. Uh, this is basically a home folder. You store all the stuff that you need lib and lib 64 has all of the libraries. So you bin and has been have programs that are basically uh, a lot of times C and C++ programs. These C and C++ programs require some libraries. These libraries are stored in lib and lib64. Uh, lost and found is something you can ignore. MNT is basically mount points. So if I put in a USB device, 
uh, it basically gets mounted on. Uh, anything that's mounted on, uh, it will appear here. Nothing is mounted on currently in my system. That's why it's empty. Then we have uh, the optional uh, directory, which has some optional information about uh, these s some of the applications that run. Then we have the processes directory that has all of the processes that are running here. This is also where we can find out, for example, our CPU. So if I, I go to uh, my terminal again and I cat uh, HC CPU uh, ID, how is it CPU ID or CPU information? That That's what it is, I guess. We can we can run a grep command. So I can just ls, uh, wait, it's I guess proc CPU ID or something. Yeah, CPU info. So it, it basically prints out everything about your CPU. So this proc command, uh, this proc folder has all of your processes and also information about the, your CPU, RAM. There's a bunch of files here which you can find out through grips, the modules, mounts, everything is here. That's what's in processes. Root is basically the home uh, directory for the root user. Normally you can't write in any or write anything in here. Uh, run anything that you are running, any services that you are running through system D. For example, I'm running containers for, I'm running my display manager. I'm running my HTTPD. I'm running my init RAMFS, all of these processes, network manager, for example, that, uh, system D that system D is basically an init system. Uh, if it is running, it's running in the run directory and there are a bunch of uh, user directory has a lot of configuration files, uh, var is some, so this is something you, once you install Linux on your computer, uh, this is something that you have to go through. This is your, I, I'll put this in your task for today. Uh, something that you have to go ahead and explore. And if you have any doubts, always feel free to ask me in Akash. So up till now, do we have any doubts? Was this a bit too much or is the pace good enough? But the pace is actually good enough. I'm okay with this pace. Right. Uh, personally. Yeah, sure. Because uh, I can go and like tell you what's inside every folder personally, but it will just take too much time of me and you. So I guess it's better for us to, once you get Arch, uh, some version of Arch Linux installed, uh, just go ahead and explore. And if you have doubts, you can always Google or ask me or Akash, right? So I guess we will proceed with this pace. Uh, let's go ahead and start with our uh, commands. Now. Uh, I just another question I had. Yeah. Uh, can I keep using like my? Uh, can you keep your user as? Hello. Yeah. Ha. Huh, so like, uh, can I keep uh, using like my? I guess the uh, Linux Mint and uh, of while I maybe like uh, have like a, a, a your uh, what do you say a TCT OS and like a virtual machine uh, or like a, should I get like uh, arch like installed on my? I would uh, recommend uh, you get system. yeah I would recommend you get uh, arch installed. Uh, it's okay if you don't want to know my, if you're used to Linux Mint, right? Uh, I created. Yes, I'm actually used to Mint. Yeah, so, sure. so not an issue. Uh, there is a cinnamon version. If you go to uh, Arch. Linux yes, I'm actually. Ah, uh, so Arch has a. Uh, yeah, I created this project two years back. So you can go to oh. downloads uh, and you can select cinnamon here. So there is a cinnamon edition that you can download and use. Uh, this is uh, pretty old. So. If you wait uh, for like, I'll, I'll give you a newer ISO today itself. So I would recommend that okay. you get Arch with Cinnamon installed. So they can play with Pac-Man and all that stuff. So you'll have to get used to uh, the UI, it's Cinnamon, so it's going to be very similar to Linux Mint. Uh, it's uh, just that you have to get used to a, a bunch of things that are Arch specific. So like, uh, uh, what exactly other than uh, like a uh, a package manager is like a specific to Arch itself. Uh, the way the kernel is handled, uh, for example, uh, Arch follows a rolling release schedule. So whatever software or whatever packages that we have on Arch, uh, they are way newer than what uh, Debian or Mint has. So on Mint, if you go, the kernel would be 
still pretty be far behind than what arch has and and the the benefit of this is because uh we will be going through something called the arch build system this is only available on arch that will be uh, basically about packaging software on arch and if you are on mint you won't be able to do this because obviously it's debian based debian has its own packaging format so yes. we will be packaging a lot of our software including probably our own custom kernel in the future so that is the reason why i want everyone to get on arch asap so that we can learn abs as soon as possible so it's not just about a pacman or installing or uninstalling software but it's more about the development aspect about building package build files which are something that is coldly specific to arch linux uh so i will be uh, so matlab uh, uh zarurat hai basically i will have to uh, uh, shift on arch just to work on this yes yes uh, uh, can i can i use like a a virtual machine maybe just maybe if that works out somehow virtual machine yeah. but you won't be able to build your isos on virtual machine because a vm itself is going to take a lot of resources in its own right and iso building process is heavily resource intensive so if you want to compile let's say a kernel or or, or any software for that matter uh doing it on a vm it's going to take you a lot of days i mean it's not even going to take you hours yeah. it's going to take you a lot of days uh should i show them should you yeah so should i show them how it's work like how much resource will it will take uh i guess let's get through the basics but yeah i can definitely guarantee because we have running short on time uh. so we'll we'll definitely show you how it uh, works akash will show you i guess in uh, today's session or tomorrow session we'll see how it works out uh, because i don't want to bombard you with a lot of information today uh, so yeah but basically uh, you should have the base machine arch it will be better cause yes, the resources it will take almost everything if you have six cores then it will consume all the six cores it will take 100% cpu when you are building an iso right yeah, it will be and over Yeah. Um, of, of, what about like the uh, uh, virtualization uh, techniques that we have, uh, like the, uh, like some of the uh, uh, CPUs have that probably. Uh, so, uh, like I don't exactly know the names, or uh, but they are something like they, like they don't have that uh, layer or something of like a translation or something. I am actually uh, not really uh, knowledgeable in that sense, but I think. Uh, that uh, that the, the virtual machine uh, gets like a, a direct access to the hardware, like close to direct access. Uh, KVM does that. Virtual box for uh-huh. hardware doesn't does that because it's level two hypervisor. The level one uh-huh. hypervisors again, they will give you near metal performance, but they yeah. won't give you exact metal performance because exact metal performance only comes from your native OS, and that is the biggest caveat here because. if you even if you even if you make an iso in a kvm environment you are still limited by your disk so not only it's resource intensive cpu and ram wise but it's also resource intensive in your space wise because on an average if i tell you it's going to take around 14 gb just to build one iso so oh, so like i think i can actually uh, as a switch to uh, uh, switch to arch and like uh, zero time or uh, up uh, But the only concern I have is like the data, I, uh, uh, data I have on this like a a machine, not a current yeah, machine I have. Addition, like, uh, easily switch now. So okay, regarding the uh, data, uh, I'll have to see a partition table maybe after the end of this uh, session, and uh, once uh, your partition table is bit uh, or if it's organized, we can switch today. otherwise we'll have to have a separate session just for getting uh, arch installed on your system i think it is like a f- fairly organized i think like a, a linux on my uh, s- uh, s- uh, system is on like an external uh, drive and i'm actually not dual uh, booting on it uh, so it's uh, so i have like a, a uh 50% approximately of for like the uh, stuff itself uh, for like the uh, s- uh, system itself and like uh, half is just like a random uh, storage and stuff so like i think i should be able to switch right no. yeah 
so not an issue we'll have probably a separate session on this yeah yeah sure, yeah. sure. so let's just uh, quickly get into uh, what i'd planned for this uh, session yeah sure yeah so, sure i think i took a bit of time yeah sure so uh, i'll be speed running this i'll also share a resource which you can obviously go ahead and uh, read in your own free time today and tomorrow so basic commands i know you guys know this already but let's do it nevertheless okay pwd print working directory you don't know where you are where you want to go or uh, sometimes you require pwd to find your absolute path uh so wh why do you need your absolute path so let's say i want to go into some command uh, in, into some directory so i can use the cd command all right uh, i can also list stuff let before we even discuss cd let's discuss list uh i'll let's go to my documents for example so i've a uh, bunch of stuff here let's go to let's say for example uh alg releases yeah so i have uh, one file here all right so i have the absolute uh, path of this i can just copy this and i can if let's say for example in my i'm in my home directory and i know the absolute path i can just copy paste that absolute path and be in the directory so uh if i were if if i'm in a particular directory which is not my home directory then i can just cd uh without you can you can also do this uh, tilde thing but yeah you can just cd into uh, from whatever uh, directory you are in you can just type in cd and you would be back in this uh, in, in your home directory and let's say uh, documents alg releases uh, i want to go back to my do documents so i can just type in cd dot dot uh this basic two periods basically mean i going back one level up so one level up is documents this command i'll go back to documents okay speed running this because i know you guys know this uh pwd cd ls pretty common commands uh another thing i want to tell you is man so if you want to look at an option you can just spawn the manual page press q to exit man cd for example uh this uses vim stuff we'll discuss vim later on but if you want to search something for example let's search for absolute maybe is there something called absolute there is something called absolute right so what did i just do is basically i used my vim keys so i can type in slash on my keyboard which is beside your i guess question mark and you can just type in stuff to search all right so this is the basic of man pages uh disk utility if you want to find out free space duf it's in the repos you can install it duf uh, is basically a very good version of df okay so i can go to man df what does it do it basically reports file system space usage so it will show you your partition table what it does uh if if i just run df it will show you a bunch of stuff that you basically can't comprehend so i can run df dash h and it will show me in human readable format which is basically uh, this is what i can't i don't know what this is unless i use a calculator so I, this will just basically show me 7.7 .7 gigs which is more readable for, for me and obviously it shows the mount points so duf always recommended it shows you uh the mount points in a more better way but always df is the command if anyone asks you what duf is based on this is it uh you also have uh, du so it shows you all the files and folders uh, this is pretty useless but if you want to see if a certain file exists in your uh, system for example i can run a du or grep uh, so now we are moving into grep okay so grep is basically let's let's look what grep is man grep okay so it basically print uh, lines that match certain patterns uh, you can read the man page later on uh, so if you saw du basically prints everything let's say i want to just print uh, alg releases for example so i can run du uh, and then i can pipe it down uh, and then i can do like alg releases and it will basically show me all the stuff that has alg releases in it for example if i want to uh, find what files i have with respect to let's say tct open source so i can do a grep uh, tct for example and it will show me everything that has tct if i want to be more specific i want tct open source only then i can do tct open source and it will show me all the tct open source stuff uh we'll go through some uh, commands to find out about our system so you can do lspci for example 
LSPCI will show me everything that uh, is on my computer. I can do LSPCI uh, dash V. It will show me more detailed information. So for example, uh, let, let's look at, uh, for example, my CPU. This is, uh, I, I'm running a 12th gen Intel. So it's using an all, it, it's showing me what uh, PCI devices I have with my CPU, my Wi-Fi, uh, my, my serial controller, which is my USB ports basically. Uh, then we have our C I2C serial controllers. These are my USB ports. I have a bunch of USB ports on, on, on this machine. Uh, and then you'll also see my graphics card here. So I'll have, so you see that I'm finding stuff manually here, right? There's my Z690 chipset here. There's also my C uh, NVIDIA corporation. This is my uh, 3060. This is my uh, 12 K K1200, whatever that is. So you see that I'm manually finding stuff. There's a bunch of information here that I'm finding. So how can I mitigate that? I can just basically run LSPCI dash V and then I can pass this through grip and I can, let's say if I want to find out uh, what my controller is, Z690, uh, it will just print the stuff that I want. Uh, I can also print stuff that uh, grep has, uh, if you run the man command, man grep, uh, A. So if you look at the A flag, let's search for it. A flag will basically show us the number of lines of trailing context uh, that you want to print. So uh, for example, if I run this command again, uh, I want to print, let's say 10 lines. Uh, so it will basically show me all the stuff that is here with respect to Z690. Let's say if I want to find out about my graphics card, uh, I can just type in uh, VGA, for example. Uh, it will show me uh, all the graphics card that I have. So I have an internal graphics card on my 12600K, uh, which is basically using the Intel uh, kernel modules. I also have my 3060, which is using the open source modules of NVIDIA. And I also have my uh, Quadro GPU, which is used. So, so my, the goal of showing you this is how grep works. Uh, you can run this on any command. You can run this with LS, like I showed you. Uh, let's let's say uh, I'm here on document. Uh, I want to, for example, just see if, uh, let's say, ALG releases is there. So I can just grab it uh, out like that. All right. So this is basically how uh, grab command works. Uh, bunch of basic commands. Again, I'll give you a document. You can read it on your own pace and practice on your own Linux computer. All right. Now we'll uh, move to Arch Linux specific stuff, which is package management. So uh, the package manager on, um, before I move to package management, does anyone have any doubts here? Or am I going too fast? Because I'm assuming all of these basic stuff you know already. So do we have any doubts with the basic stuff? Or let me know if I can like move forward, all right? Oh, no, it's not. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I don't have that. So, so we'll we'll move with uh, Pacman. Pacman is our package manager. Uh, you might have seen me when when I installed DUF. I I just wrote in install DUF. Uh, actually, this is an alias. If I run alias, if I uh, so aliases. These are bunch of commands that I can use to automate my uh, daily life so that I don't have to type in all of these commands, but these are basically what's running. So if you look at install, uh, this is what it's doing. So uh, sudo pacman dash s package name. Okay. So let's say if I want to install, uh, what can I install? Let's say it's stop is there already. Let, let's remove it stop. Okay. So alias, uh, I have something to auto remove my packages. So I can sudo pacman dash r and edge stop, uh, I made a mistake, edge stop. So it will remove edge stop. If I want to install edge stop, I can sudo pacman dash s install edge stop. All right, so not install, sorry. Sudo pacman dash s edge stop and edge stop is here. Uh, if I want to synchronize my databases, I can sudo pacman dash s y. This will synchronize my databases. Currently Arch Linux has core and extra community is being deprecated right now. So core and extra are the two databases where all your packages will come from. If you want to search for a certain package you do sudo pacman dash sc and name of pacman. Uh, so wow, pacman. Uh, and I can search the package. So for example, let's search for btop. 
uh, you can see that wait it's a uh, pseudo pacman dash s s so you can search uh, you can look at that btop is there in the extra repo and you can basically install it with sudo pacman dash s btop so this is how you basically install packages all right so once you install your packages uh, just give me a minute uh, i'm in a meeting i'll call you back okay so this is how you install packages let's go to our alias command again we have i showed you how to remove packages how to install packages how to search for packages uh, if you want package information let's say i want to have information about it stop so i can do sudo pacman dash q i h stop and it will list all of the information what architecture it's based for what are the licenses and all of that stuff all right again uh, sync i told you you can synchronize your databases arch is rolling release so you always have to synchronize your databases at least once in a day uh, updating you can uh, so if i type in update for example this is going to install all of the packages that are there this is something that you shouldn't do daily it will do so it says starting full system upgrade uh, this is what it does upgrade all of the packages so for example firefox has an um, update if i uh, look for uh, sudo pacman dash qs firefox this current version of firefox that is ins uh, installed in my system is 113.0 uh, the latest version that is available is 114.0 so basically full system upgrade will up update all of the packages now if say i just want to uh, update firefox just just the package itself i don't want to upgrade each and everything for example if uh, let's let's look at vlc for example I don't want to uh, update Firefox because it's running right now. So VLC is 3.0.18. Uh, if you look at 18-9, uh, okay, this is the version that is installed in my system. And uh, VLC that is currently available in the repo is dot dash 11. So 11 is the latest version, all right? So if I want to update just VLC, what I can do is sudo pacman dash s VLC. It's just like installing a package, but what this basically does is it's going to update it to the latest version. So like I said, if I do a pacman dash qs vlc, it's showing me 3.9. I'm going to update this. All right, it's going to take some time. Now it's done. I run the command again, and vlc is now the latest version. All right. So this is the basics of pacman. I will. Uh, you can always once you are on an art system, run your manual page. It's pretty intuitive. I'll also give you. Uh, if you go to github.com slash art uh it's probably in uh, plasma there's all of these aliases you will find out uh, let's say scale bash rc aliases uh, you can get all of these sh shortcuts I i'm putting this in chat uh, you guys can have a look so this is how you install and install packages uh, again you this is something that what you'll understand once you practice hands-on so i'll i just showed you how it works but uh, always practice it out uh, and you will be more confident and better doing this uh, networking commands uh, we'll, we'll now move to networking commands uh, networking commands uh, basically ip adder on arch linux it will show you your ip address your inet is basically your ipv4 address and basically uh, i'm running docker instances here so you have your docker you have your wlan 0 uh, what is the difference? Okay, well, we'll, we have one, two, three, and f four and five, all right? So when I run IP address, loop, this is your loopback, uh, something that you can ignore. Uh, I'm basically connected on LAN cable, so whenever you l uh, are connected through a cable, it's going to be ENP something, something, something. When you are connected through uh, Wi-Fi, it's going to be WLAN something, something, something. And this is if you're running containers on your system. So this is the networking for Docker, all right? So always, uh, depending on whether you're on cable versus Wi-Fi, uh, cable, it will be ENP something, WLAN is going to be ENP something, INET is going to be your IPv4 address. This is what you will be using to use SSH, for example. So SSH, you can use username uh, at IP address. This is something that you will be using as a DevOps engineer throughout. This is something that is beyond the scope of Linux right now when you are doing clustering, when you are basically working, we'll come to server room once you're all back from your villages or your native places. Once you're back in Mumbai, we'll go to our server room 
and we'll show you how SSH works. But this is basically how it works. This is the command for how SSH works. This is networking stuff that should be practice hands on. So you will see this in college. VM, uh, like Sartak said, uh, I we can use VM, but uh, again, it's resource intensive. So if you want to spawn a VM, for example, you can spawn VirtualBox, you can spawn KVM. I use this, I, I personally use GNOME boxes, it's pretty chill, uh, just because it's uh, very easy to manage stuff. So GNOME boxes is one application you can use, it uses KVM in the backend. Uh, let me install VirtualBox, or maybe do I have VirtualBox? I don't have VirtualBox, so let's install it. So I can do a sudo pacman dash s virtual box so i'm on the uh, i'm on the basic kernel basically so i'll be using this one dkms what this does uh, this is a direct kernel mod setting i'll let you know what this is when we get into compiling our own custom kernel and all that stuff but if you are on basic arch with like most of us are just go ahead with this package post modules so virtual box is here i'll have to run a mod probe let me just initialize the uh, driver all right so i have virtual box uh, in my system is it there it's not there for some reason why is it not there virtual ah, there it is so virtual box is here uh there's some problem with virtual box on my system the problem is basically uh it basically there it, it's disabled from the bios so if i plan to uh, spawn a vm what i'm teaching you is pro about processes and how to kill processes this is important so i'm going to be spawning a faulty vm just to show you i'm just going to type in arch linux and i'm just going to select an iso image uh it should be let's say uh, let me just bring this here I'll just quickly grab an ISO image, uh, XFCE, let's say, uh, maybe let's go with plasma, plasma here, out. Okay, so I have an ISO here in my VM. Uh, next, I'm just going to give it the base, uh, a bunch of, I, I, I guess this is fine. This is fine, uh, finish. Now I spawn a VM, it's probably going to get stuck. Yeah, it's stuck basically. Uh, and it's pretty annoying because I can't do anything with it. So the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to show you how to kill processes that are basically stuck. So I can find out the PID, P, uh, PID of virtual box. So the PID of virtual box is 12, six, uh, 16, 240. But uh, currently we just also spawned a VM here, which is not responsive. So what I can do is do VirtualBox VM and the PID of this is uh, 16529. So let me just pull this to the side and I'm going to kill this process right in front of you just because it's not responsive and I want to get rid of this. So I can just type in kill dash nine and then the PID. So this is 16529. I'm going to paste this here. And then you see that it's gone. I can also kill any application for that matter, VirtualBox, Firefox, any process that is running. I just need to find the process ID, PID is process ID. And I can, for example, if I type in the PID of uh, Firefox, for example, it is running on a bunch of these PIDs. Again, because Firefox is a browser, it has a bunch of things to run. But uh, let's say I, I ran the PID of uh, VirtualBox, right? Six to, uh, 16 to 40. So I can basically just I can press X here also, but I can kill this process by typing the PID. So this is how you do it. It's gone, right? So in today's session, I wanted to clear a bunch of basic commands. Uh, it's all written here. I guess I did most of it. If you have any doubts, we'll have five minutes, five, 10 minutes doubt sessions. And then I guess uh, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, what is the minus nine? So minus nine, if you go through, okay. So if I do minus uh, man man uh, kill, so 
dash l is basically the amount of signal that you want to uh, put into killing the process uh, if you look at this n 9 is basically the biggest number that you can use uh, it, it's it's basically has highest precedence so if you use uh, dash 1 or dash 0 uh, you you basically might end up not killing the process dash 9 is highest precedence so it force kills the process uh, automatically i hope that answers the question so we can have any other doubts if you have uh, i'll like i said i'll be sharing the resources uh, you can go to uh, i guess uh, what's that guy's name uh, it's flavio 50 commands yeah Flav flavio 50 commands this is the handbook uh, it has all of this um, bunch of commands here around 60 you won't be using a lot of them uh, the main ones are what you have to focus on uh, it has all the use cases how you're going to use it all right so i'm posting this here so you guys can uh, take your time today and tomorrow uh go through this yeah so 